Well, hello again, and I'm here for the reading of Dolor and Shadow. I will be reading chapter two today, and then chapter three, and we'll also have a video posted for the featured author, uh, Francis H. Powell, and who is in charge in hosting the blog tour, I'm sorry, the uh, festive blog hop uh, for this holiday season. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get reading. And uh, just a reminder that we have, uh, this is a several day event, a posting from 16th of December going on until the 24th, yes, the 24th of December. So we're going to go ahead and, okay, and this is chapter two. And as you can see, this is Gunier. This is just, see you can't really see it, but you get the idea. Okay. If you missed chapter one reading, uh, this is 10 years later from the first chapter. So we're going to fast forward into the future 10 years. Swan pushed open the heavy oak door of room's chambers. The hinges whined and her silver eyes peered through the crack. The sitting room was empty. Braver than she had been a moment ago, the girl threw open the door, slipped into her brother's bower, and quietly closed the door behind her with her back pushed flat against the oak. The hem of her silk chemise caressed her bare toes. Her golden locks framed her slender face before falling to her knees. A soft smile pulled her lips, and as she pushed herself off the door, she brought her hands to her front, clasping a small box filled with her newest treasure. Skipping lightly, she crossed the eastern rug that spanned the length of the grand sitting room. Dyed with reds and gold, the rug filled, in, filled the sitting room with regal warmth and caressed the tips of her toes as she made her way to the dresser to rummage through her brother's things. Rich wood decorated every corner and ornamented the wardrobe, the tables, and the mantel. The desk, the chairs, even the wooden framework surrounding the doors, and each of the four windows were ornamented with the craft of the Leosifer woodcutters. Few could claim their equal. Humming a ditty, Swan arrived at her brother's desk and rifled, combed, and turned over every artifact. Sing and skip off every mountain, she sang as she inspected a broken piece of thick green glass that had come from the desert market. Far the hill and through the dawn, Swan moved on. Swan moved on to the center window and welcomed the earliest of morning light. A recurve bow and quiver resting in a chair didn't interest her, nor did the collection of sharpened swords laid out on a corner table. With a deep breath, she leaned out the window, ignoring the courtyard below. She looked to Lake Vanir, where the longboats creaked in port. Swan widened her smile at the sunlight and morning breeze as she turned her gaze to the east, beyond the city's end, and across the river to the Alpine Wood. A groan from the bedchamber pulled her, fr pulled her from the window, and Swan grinned with rejuvenated excitement. Pushing off the window sill, she ran to the bedroom as if ready to burst from the news she was eager to tell. Encumbered with sleep, Rune lay buried beneath a mountain of blankets, furs, and pillows. Rune, Swan sang in sing-song. He knew her voice but couldn't move to answer. A weight in the dreaming was holding him still. Wake up, she said, but Rune didn't wake. Instead, the voice penetrated his dream and became part of it. Roon, she said as she climbed his body like the steps of Jontunheim and sang, her voice as crisp as fresh fallen snow on ice. Sing and skip of fairy mounds are the hill and through the dell, where sleep's joy spins my dream, there the moonlight finds its beam. Clutching her small box, Swan slipped on Roon's hip and caught herself before breaking off into the second verse. Sing and skip of fairy mounds are the hill and through the dell, where the rolling brook doth play are the hill and far away. Without hesitation, Swan projected her voice into the morning air that blew in with a breeze through Roon's chamber room, uh, through Roon's chamber window. As Swan climbed and chanted, her locks spilled over the blankets like sunlight. Swan succeeded in perching herself atop Rune and shoved her face so close the tip of her nose grazed his. Rune! she shouted, pulling Rune from his dream. With a howl, Rune pushed a pillow into his sister's face, sending her falling onto her back with a pillow, her box, and her golden tresses. Undaunted, Swan jumped up and slapped the pillow back on Rune, who would pulled his, his, his blankets over his head. Before he could groan, Swan broke off into another verse. Sing and skip of fairy mounds are the hill and through the dell where the ancient scrolls doth lay. Think of their secrets far away. Rune, Swan said, relinquishing the pillow. What? The furs on Rune's head muffled his voice. Swan grinned. Great, you're awake. Another groan. With a hop, Swan said, Rune, come. You must see, you must see. I found one. Swan squealed as she bounced on her knees beside him. 
Found what? Rowan asked, refusing to budge from beneath the blankets. A face mound, Swan cried and sang. Sing and skip a fairy mound, o'er the hill and through the dell. Fairy song will lead you there to the sunlit hall so fair. Just like what Mother said, Swan exclaimed the moment her song was done, and glowing as if sunlight flowed from the earth, just like the one she saw in Ersland. Huffing, Rowan threw back his blankets. His blue-tinted silver eyes squinted in the light. You found a fairy mound, he asked, arching a single brow in doubt. Swan nodded vigorously. Swan, Rune slapped the furs. His lack of enthusiasm did nothing to deter her spirits. I suppose I'll have to go see. Get up, Swan said, throwing her hands into the air and leaping down from the bed. Her hair followed like golden rain. Not right away, Swan, Rune swung his legs over the side of the bed. I have lessons all morning with Gareth, and if I skip them again, he'll have my hide, not to mention the hell I'll get from father. Swan dropped her arms and slugged with the box, still tucked away in her hand. But the holiday... Swan said over a puffed bottom lip. It's Astromonoth. Not for another few days. The Dalkovar haven't even arrived yet, Rune scolded, and watched as his sister curled her bottom lip out further. I'll be around later. Swan didn't move. Rune groaned, throwing himself onto his bed and staring at the ceiling. Ugh! When would you like me to be there? He asked. Now! Swan said, making a full recovery from her sulking. Swan, Rune said, and she was on the bed again, holding her face upside down over his with a wide-eyed grin that never waned. Rune batted at one of her locks. Go on ahead, Rune said. Do whatever it is you do in the valley of yours, and I'll meet up with you before the sun is high. Her jovility fell again, but she did her best to hide her disappointment. That's what Berrigan said. Swan sat back on her legs and did her best not to look too upset. Rune crunched his brow. Berrigan's back? With a grin, Swan nodded. When did he get back? Just, she sang, thrilled to know something her brother didn't. Look what he brought me back from Rakadet, she said, and shoved her precious box into his face. Rune sat up, turned himself around, and flipped up the latch. The hinges creaked. Inside, nestled in red eastern silk, an egg gleamed in the light. Vibrant yellow circles capped each end, where, line, where lines like sunbursts spilled into the black base coat. The rays met the peaks of deep blood-red mountains that encircled the egg. Their bases stopped where a wide strip of black enveloped the egg center. There, within the strip of black, a red circle drew Rune's attention. It's a worm. Rune said as he made out an image of a snake, twisted into a signet until it had formed a circle. Two black slits like eyes peered from in between the snake's body. A single yellow eye dotted its head and its tail, and Rune turned the egg upside down. With two heads, Rune said, seeing the dotted tail was indeed another head. He turned the fragile jewel over to find a second signet snake that mirrored the first. Where did he get this? Swan bounced as if she would burst. Bergen said it was a gift. Rune turned the egg over again, clearly unable to tear, tear his eyes away. Did he now? He said, It was a gift from the queen who ruled the lands below the White Sea. Swan repeated Berrigan's words verbatim, with an air of mysticism, as she stared at the ceiling and thought, then leaned over Rune's shoulder and added in a normal voice, He said it came from a Sclavinian ship. Sclavinian, Rune said. He knew the name too well. Berrigan gave you this. Rune peered up at Swan. All the more reason why you should he heed Berrigan's request and go play in the valley. Rune grinned and Swan sighed, taking back her egg with an eye roll that became a head roll. Carefully, she returned it to its silk and latched the lid like a treasured secret. You're older, Swan said. I was hoping you would override Bergen's instructions. Rune smiled. Older by moments. Enough to be heir, perhaps, Rune said. Besides, no one really tells Bergen what to do. Not even father. Before the sun is high, she asked, looking up from her box. Rune nodded. Promise, Swan said. And you'll bring Bergen too? I do, and I will, Rune said. Hala, Swan announced, and slid off the bed. As she ran from the room, she sang, Sing and skip a fairy mounds o'er the hill and through the dell, Where the mystical spriggans play o'er the hill and far away. Forced to pull his body from bed, Rune stumbled into his garter robe and began to ready himself for the day. A gift from the queen who ruled the lands below the White Sea. Astromonoth was no excuse to skip lessons today. But Bergen's return from Rakadet was. If he hurried, there was time enough to hunt a bear and slip a little something into Bergen's bed. Thank you again for uh, tuning in. Uh, we have uh, YouTube. Please go ahead and subscribe. And also subscribe to the website if you're interested in receiving more updates and book readings like this. Thank you again very much. And we have Chapter 3 reading to come along with a featured author, Francis H. Powell. Thank you.